in the 40th year, when the Jews were in the desert, you'd think this is the new generation. The old generation passed away. They're about to enter. And all of a sudden, something comes to their mind and they say, we've had enough of this wafer food that we've been needing all these years. They refer to it as lechem klokel, this light, this light wafer, this cracker type food. And what they had said is Rashi cites the Midrash that the man was a miracle type food that whatever they would think they would want it to take on in terms of its value, it took on that value. Nourishment wise, and it sated them. But it was miraculous, there was no waste. The food, the man absorbed in their inner organs, there was no waste. And he started to say, maybe the reason why all these years that we've ingested it, it was only a delayed reaction, but ultimately, Hashem's intent is that this manna that we've been ingesting all these years will expand in our intestines, and our intestines will burst. This is where they came up with this, but you know, crazy thing come, things come to people's minds. Immediately what happens, so they actually spoke against Hashem. They slandered him, saying all this is a ploy, that he wants us to die. And now in the 40th year we're about to go in, we're going to die because this is all going to expand in our intestines and we, our intestines are going to burst. Hashem sends vipers to bite them, they start dying. And they say we sinned against God, against you Moshe, remove the snake from us. And he goes to Hashem, God says he should build a copper snake on a high pole, and whoever looks at the snake will recover. So firstly, why in the 40th year, why at that moment, did all of a sudden this thing come to their mind? What happened? You know, even when the Satan, they see the generation who are at Sinai, about the age of 20, they will perish because they spoke Lashon Hara, the spies, the sword of spies. They brought back ominous reports regardless of what they thought. God said it's a land that flows with milk and honey. But although they realized they had made this grave mistake, it was too late. There was no going back. Because what they had done, that generation was called the Chil Hashem. After God shows you everything, he proves to you endless times over that he's committed to you to the nth degree. How do you suspect that he's out to destroy you? It's unforgivable. You will die. New generation. So they see clearly God's faithfulness to the Jews. We're about to go in. And to the new generation. This is the generation that did not sin and was not liable for the sin of the spies. The last moment, literally, they come up with this concocted, distorted reality. And again, there's problems. What caused it? We find that when they were, Moshe Rabbeinu originally had sent messengers to the Edomite kingdom. And they said, they asked them, we'd like to pass through your territory. It gives them the whole background. We're in Egypt and we prayed to God and so on and so forth. And we redeemed. And we're asking you to go through your territory. And if we, although we have our own provisions, we have our own food, we have our own water, we'll buy you from you to patronize you. So you'll gain from us. Edom comes out against Moshe with a sword. And they said, you're not passing through our territory. God says, if that's the case, you have to detour around the territory. It would have been a much shorter route going straight, straight through the territory. Okay? Now, what was this, their response? He tells them that Hashem heard our voice. So Moshe was saying to the Edomites, you realize we have a special blessing from our forefather, Hakol Kol Yaakov, that our power, power lies in our speech, supplication, in Torah. 
So when the Torah tells us, Vayetze Edom, the cross of Bechorev, Edom went out towards them with the sword, and Torah makes it a point, and said, you will not cross into our territory. So they had said, you're boasting that you have the blessing from your forefather, that you're blessed with the power of speech. We have a blessing from that same forefather, by the sword you shall live. So don't intimidate us. You're not going through. God says, you're not going through. This is just a little bit of an aside. We find immediately after this happens, the Torah tells us, Moshe says to, Hashem says to Moshe, go with Aaron to the Hor Hor, and he will pass away there. And his son Eliezer will become the high priest. Now why does the Torah juxtapose the passing of Aaron to this incident about passing through the Edomite territory? Seemingly it's unrelated. Why at this particular moment? So Rashi cites the Midrash that whenever, because we were exposed to the evil ones, the Edomites or, or Esau, the descendants of Esau, it's Nifrut Tzmasein Shal Yisrael. Immediately, the behavior of the Jews, the record of Jews is breached. When we're engaged with the evil people, our record is breached. The question is, if you'd said uh, due to the exposure, there was some level of influence and they had sinned, we understand. There's no mention of sinning over here. The Jews want to go through a territory. Moshe sent agents. They rejected them. They're going on. But because they were in the proximity, they engaged with this evil one, therefore our actions were breached. How do we understand it? We discussed many times in the name of the Ramchal, Rabbi Lutzato, what is Midas Arachim and what's Midas Adin? What's the attribute of justice? What's the attribute attribute of mercy. Attribute of mercy means although we have a flawed record and God knows it, the only time there is a consequence due to the record is only when the record is audited and prosecuted. Who prosecutes the record? That's Satan. Satan. Satan is the prosecutor of Israel. Midas Adin, if the Jews should fail and do something very severely wrong, Satan comes into the picture, he says, you can't keep me silent any longer. And he begins prosecuting. Prosecutes, it's disastrous. That's the attribute of justice. But otherwise, there's Mitzah Rachmi. We're under the protection of the attribute of, of mercy. Now, the Chavetz Chaim writes, regarding, we had said that Although it says that when one does a mitzvah, you cannot be rewarded as many years as you live. As much goodness God gives you this world, it's not sufficient to cover the value of a mitzvah. Therefore, God reserves the value, the reward for the mitzvah of the world to come. But yet, people who are evil, who don't deserve and don't want to share in the world to come, Mishalem al of the the Soto Lavido. God pays his enemies in this world that they should go into the oblivion. So the Chavetz Chaim explains what an allegory. Very interesting. Allegory. People see evil people. Jews. Bad people. They don't have a bad day in their lives. Always healthy, succeeding, thriving, and living long lives. You know, a Rolls Royce or a Bentley for every other day. Every day of the week. Another mansion for every day of the week. Every type of delicacy, only the best of everything. Forbes 100. Okay? They say it doesn't make sense. Russia, the Tovlo. The evil one has it good. Doesn't make sense. Why? And people are envious. And the person who's hoeing the road and struggling. I'm doing everything God wants and I have difficult making ends meet. And there's illness and problems in the family. Why? Doesn't make sense. So he explains it with an allegory. There was this minister who had behaved in a way which he deserved to be punished. Because the minister was arrogant and haughty and did not act with proper respect to the king. So the king said, 
I want a palace to be built identically to my palace. It should be furnished identically to my, to my as my, my palace is furnished. I want my tailor to fashion for him regal garments as my garments are regal. However, there's one precondition. When the, this palace is built, I want there should be windows built from floor to, to the roof that people could gaze into the palace while this minister is living as a king, although he's a commoner. In the palace, like the ultimate royalty. Nothing is lacking, except people didn't realize this person will not have food or water. When he goes into this palace and the door will be sealed and he's gonna have to fend for himself and he's gonna have no source of food or water, okay? And he has a whole, it's published in the newspaper. This minister is being given the honor going to this palace, being treated with a musical accompaniment, goes in, they seal it, goes in. People are watching through the windows. He goes in and the envy, they're dripping with envy. Whoever heard of such a thing? A commoner should be accorded such glory and such honor and such regalness. It's unheard of. The history of the world never happened. And people, they can't get over it. And his peers, the other ministers, envious. They thought maybe the king lost his mind. He's off. Day passes, three days pass. All of a sudden this person, he's getting a, a, a pail of what? Like he's sickly, sickly pale. A week passes, no food, no water. He can barely walk. And he has this ravenous appetite. And he starts tearing flesh out of his arm. That's how, the, Otherwise he's dying. He's literally eating himself up alive. And within two weeks, they look through this window. They see something so grotesque. They can't look at it. The level of inhumanity. And then they understood that this person, which they thought he was given the ultimate, and it was worthy to envy... You want to run from this? You want nothing to do with this. Understanding that this palace and all this opulence, what was given to him, what's the end? He's going to eat his own flesh. To die a death which is so painful and ugly and gruesome, nobody wants it in any way identified with that. So the Chavetz Chaim explains, if a person, when a person lives high on the hog, although he's evil, the Rolls Royce, the Bentley, the everything, every for another day of the week. Never a bad day in his life. You know what this cost him? He has no share in the world to come. This is the payoff. It's the equivalent. He's eating his own flesh. He's going to the depths of Gehenna, of hell, to suffer a level of suffering not to be fathomed or imagined. So what they're envying, they don't understand there's nothing to envy. You want no relevance or association with this. You don't want to identify with this. That's what it's about. So it comes out, B'shalim l'son of part of the When God pays off those who he despises in the lives to send Bolivian, this is the ultimate in Adin. What people see as the ultimate in God giving them, treating them in the most exceptional, positive way, this is the most extreme justice of Midas Adin. That's what it is. So now, what, what, was the, what was the divide and the division between Yaakov and Esau? Esau, he was given this world. He controls Ed, the Edomites, his, uh, his power. The physical world is theirs. Yaakov is Koko Yaakov. Torah and supplication, the power of speech. That was the, the, the division between the two of them. When Esau, Edom was given this world to live high in the hog, to be always in a position of power, what does that mean? That's the extent of his existence. The moment he leaves this existence, he will go into, into the oblivion. So basically, all the power and all the blessings so forth that he has is the most extreme level of the attribute of justice. That's what it is. 
Yaakov, although we struggle and have difficulty at many levels, but ultimately, the Kol calls Yaakov. What is the value? What is the reward for Torah? One moment, a whole existence cannot pay you off the value for, for the value of one moment of Torah. God reserves that for the world to come. Nobody's perfect. We don't have a perfect record. Therefore, God wants us to pay the debt in this world. Or God gives us challenges in this world to increase the value of what we do in this world. So the, so the value in the world to come should even be magnified and greater. So again, you have to see the perspective has to be a proper perspective. So now, during World War II, there was a Holocaust. Six million Jews were murdered. Now, what was the attribute which Europe was impacted with? No question, the attribute of justice. The Jews who lived in the Northern Hemisphere, they were under the guise of what? Of attribute of Rachmi. We had mercy. But if God forbid a Jew would go to Europe from America and be there, you were under the attribute of justice. Although you're an American, it doesn't make a difference. It's that region is under the attribute of justice. Prosecution, whatever it is being prosecuted. Everybody's record is being prosecuted. When that record is prosecuted, there's no, there's no mercy. Other parts of the world where the attribute of justice was not implemented, it's Rahmim. We may have had some degree of deprivation or pain hearing what was going on, but nothing compared to what they experienced over there. Now, the Jews approached the Edomites in the proximity of Edom, and they said, we would like to pass through your territory. When they went to Edom, the Edom region, what region were they entering into? Into the region of Midas Adin. That was the attribute of justice. They live with power and wealth and prominence and reverence. The world stands in awe of the Edomites because of their power. But you realize, but that's me, Sadin, that's the attribute of justice. Because that's the last nail in that coffin in terms of what they're having. So we entered into their proximity. What happens to our record? Our record starts being audited. Not that the Jew doesn't have to sin. It's a different evaluation. The evaluation is the Midas din now. It's prosecution. Therefore, that's why it says, Nifzu Maseim Shel Yisrael. The actions of the Jews all of a sudden are breached. We find all of a sudden cracks and crevices in those. In there. It's not what, where it should be. Under normal circumstances, it's not a problem. So what does Hashem do? God takes Aaron HaKoyim. Aaron being the almost the equivalent of Moshe Rabbeinu in certain aspects or the equivalent, he's taken to atone, to silence and quell the Midas Adin, the prosecution of Satan. But not the Jews didn't have to sin. So whenever you put yourself in a position where others are being judged on the valuation of Midas Adin, the attribute of justice, automatically whoever's within that group will the same yardstick, same evaluation will be made for them. This is the understanding. But why did the Jews right away say, and that right after that, they said, what's with all this food? We're eating this wafer food. They come up with this crazy idea that all this miracle we've been beating all these years, we haven't done our bodily functions. It's a ploy of God that he wants that all this should expand our intestines and should burst. It was right after this incident. Where did this crazy idea come to the heads? Which ultimately caused that God should send vipers. That they, buy, to buy, they should be bitten, they should die. They were venomous snakes, that's where they were. So the Chavetz Chaim explains that because they spoke out of order, they shouldn't have, first of all, as I said, they were exposed, they were there. Right away, you see things wrongly. Part of the eight, part of the prosecution is we're going to get you, but there has to be a basis really to to punish you. They get this crazy idea, but why? Because again, you know, it came to their mind. Whenever we were about to enter, there was always a delay. They would go through the Edomite territory. All of a sudden, we're not going. Maybe there's a replay. 
of the past generation. We were supposed to go, there was a delay. Maybe we're not going. They misread that. And that was the basis for them to come up with this, this new distorted reality. You know what this is? This is a ploy. God doesn't want to take us in. He wants to kill us. How is he going to kill us? The money is going to expand in our intestines because we've never done our body functions because he wants us to die. So what does God say to them? You people are kfuye tova. And I always say, what's kfuye tova? Not just not appreciative. You're ingrates. Ingrates means you invert something. Rather than seeing it properly for what it is, you turn it backwards. You give a person the vaccine, which is, which is supposed to give you life, and you say you're injecting us to end our life. Just the opposite. You know, during the war, the Nazis, Yemach Shmum, they were such rabid anti-Semites. They were so, so, they saw the Jew as the closest, as the devil himself, Yemach Shmum. There was a Nazi who needed a blood transfusion. And the only thing that would save his life, they would have to take the blood from a Jew. He says, I don't want the blood of a Jew in my body. I don't want, that's, that's worse than death. Could you imagine? That was the hate they had for the Jew. What the Jew represents. What's life is death, or worse than death. Here I give you something, which is the ultimate, and you say rather than me providing something, which is to put you at a, 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 on a pedestal, which is unheard of, you say you're digging a grave so deep that you can't come out of that grave. And that's what they said. So what does God do? Sends the snakes, the vipers. So now the Chofetz Haim has a number of readings of, of the language, the Torah, which is difficult. Additionally, it says, they spoke against Elohim and Moshe. The appellation which is used in Torah is Elohim which is the attribute of justice and Moshe. When they realized the mistake they made, when the vipers started to bite them and they started to die, they said, we spoke against Hashem and Moshe. The appellation all of a sudden changes. It's Yudke Vovke, which is the attribute of mercy and Moshe. That's one difference. Then also, initially it says, God sent the Nechoshim Srofim, the vipers which consume them with their venom. And when they pray, they came to Moshe and says, remove the nochosh, the snake from us. No longer the snake that cons which consumes us with their venom. Just the word nochosh. We find a number of changes. And it says initially, the two uh, term terminologies, two classifications. Om, which means people, means ordinary people. Yisrael means the more advanced Jew, the more spiritual Jew. It says, v'noshchu es om, they bit the people. Meaning when the snakes, the vipers came, they bit the commoners. Okay? And then it says, and a great number of Yisrael died. It says they bit the, or, the commoners, but... Many of the Israel died. Did the communists, were they bitten? Or were the Israel died? So the Chavz Chaim explains it this way. When they spoke against God, who spoke against God? wasn't the special Jew. The Jew was more learned, the more spiritual did not speak. The commoners spoke against God. And what did they say? They spoke against Elohim. Elohim over there is referring to the creator. We find when the, the original snake in the Garden of Eden came to Chava, and he says, Elohim doesn't want you to eat of the tree of knowledge. Because he doesn't want competition. God ate of that tree, this, and he became a creator. He doesn't want you to be a creator. The same terminology. So their behavior was similar to the ancient serpent in the Garden of Eden. And therefore, it's Elohim. Because they spoke against Elohim, as the snake had done originally, and Moshe, that's why it happened. When they realized they made the mistake, 
they they want and they were pleading for mercy. And they saw just the opposite, just to the contrary. That that he gave us the, the mon wasn't the attribute of justice. That it should expand in our innards to die, but it was that we shouldn't have to do our bodily functions. Because if you did, you have to go out of the camp and, and the inconvenience is great. So it's just the opposite. What they saw as the most negative was the most positive. Okay? God sent the vipers that consumed them with the venom. Nechoshim srofim. They said, remove the nochosh from us, the snake. Chavetz Chaim had cited a Zohar in the past. We've mentioned it a number of times, which he cited. The Zohar says that when people speak Loshon HaRa, it brings great destruction to the world and death. Why? Because whenever the Satan wants to prosecute Jewish people, Hashem says, I don't want to hear you speaking about my children. I don't want to hear about it. But when the Jews speak about themselves, he goes to Hashem and says, look the way they speak about themselves. Each one is criticizing and prosecuting one another. Where there's no basis for that prosecution. I will have a flawed record. You can keep me silent. Hashem says, if that's the case, prosecute. Let the record be audited. Hosmin nochosh. Remove from us that nochosh means the spiritual power, which is the nochosh means the, the ultimate prosecutor of the Jewish people. That's what he's talking about. Because they realize that the, what they mistake, made a mistake. Because that prosecutor is prosecuting. He says something very interesting. When we were in the desert, the Torah says explicitly, there were snakes that were literally, you couldn't survive the desert because of these poisonous snakes. But we had the Ani Akobot, the clouds, they would actually would destroy them. And that's how we merited that divine protection. Because the Jews no longer had divine protection, meaning the ones who spoke against God, the vipers were sent specifically, they should be bitten. The ones who did not speak, the Jewish people no, no longer had that divine protection. If you no longer have divine protection, now you could be bitten because the desert is a location where you have those snakes. So it says, they were sent to bite the Om. They bit, Om means the ordinary people, those are the people who spoke against God. They were sent specifically to punish them. The others, it says, a number, a great number of Yisrael were bitten. Not that they were sent to be bitten, but because the Jewish people no longer had that divine protection, therefore, they were subject just to the circumstance. You're in a desert. You're subject to that, that problem, because nobody's perfect. Just to mention, the mercies and brochos. We know whenever there was a problem, Klaus would go to Reb Hanina Mendoza. Hanina Mendoza, he was a person who all lived on a small measure of carob from, from Erev Shabbos to Erev Shabbos. And every day there's a heavenly voice that goes out and announces to the world, the whole world is sustained in the merit of Hanina Beni. Hanina, my son, my beloved son, should die low bekav harub me'er Shabbos Erev Shabbos. That it's sufficient for him the small measure of carob. So whenever they would need someone to supplicate, to pray on behalf of the Kalal he was the one they would go to. So what happened? There was a, a, a poisonous lizard that had its, and its liar was there, come out and it would bite people. And people were dying or people were getting very sick. So they came to Rabbi Mendoza and they said to him, we got a problem. You have to take care of it. So he says, where is its hole in the ground? And he goes and he puts his foot over the, the hole and what do you think happens? He, this lizard bites Rabbi Hanim Bedosa. And what do you think happens? The lizard dies. Rabbi Hanim Bedosa is not affected, but the lizard dies. Rabbi Hanim Bedosa picks up this lizard, carries it on his shoulder, and walks through the street and says, it's not the lizard that kills, it's the sin that kills. Because you see, I was bitten, it died, I didn't die. So it comes out interesting. As perfect as they were, they were imperfect. The ones who spoke Lashon Hara, they, the, the vipers were sent to bite them. The others, because they did not have the divine protection, they were bitten. Why were they bitten? But even if you bit, you're not supposed to die. Because it's a chet memes. 
It's not the snake that kills. It's not the venom. It's the sin. That's why you're susceptible to what to be to die by through the venom. Answer is because they weren't perfect enough. They were also not perfect. Many years ago, there was a certain couple. The marriage was a disaster. The woman, the word shrew is an understatement of what this woman was. The way she treated her husband, the way she behaved, was disastrous. So the person says to me, and he treated her very specially, treated her like a queen. But whatever he did, nothing was appreciated, nothing. So he figured he's going to divorce her. So somehow he was afraid to say that he's divorcing. He says, the rabbi agreed I should divorce you. Me. I get a, a message on my machine. This is when we're on 63rd Street. Her father was a Holocaust survivor. He opened a mouth, left a message. Every considerable curse that he could curse me, God forbid, he's because I caused his daughter to be divorced. Because I was the one who actually put that, encouraged that the marriage should end, which w was not true. I'll tell you, I'd listen to it, I felt sick. The words of what he said and how he said it. And he himself knows what it means to suffer. He was in the Holocaust. So I called up Rav Chaim Kenevsky in Israel at the time. The story goes back many years ago. Maybe 28 years ago. I called up Rav Chaim Kenevsky. Rav Chaim Kenevsky says that you have nothing to worry about because those words are only if you deserve to be that. But if you don't deserve it, just to the contrary, He's going to be the, he's going to have the consequence of his curse. That's what he said to me. Not to be worried. I was worried in any case. Nobody's perfect, but that's, understand. If you have nothing to worry about, there's nothing to worry about. Because the curse can only affect the person if he has relevance to that. So that's what he says. If you don't, you have nothing to worry about. If you have sin, that we, we discussed the Sifarno, the meal offering, which was the toda, the thanks offering, one brought 40 loaves of bread besides the animal as the sacrifice. 30 loaves were made of matzah, 10 loaves were made of chametz, or leavened. This is out of the ordinary. Every meal offering was matzah, was not chametz, was not leavened. But 10 of the 40 loaves were, were, were chametz, were leavened. Why? So he explains. What is a total offering? Person tra travels the high seas, comes back alive. You give thanks to God. He allowed you to survive. You travel the desert. Person recovers from a serious illness. Thanks offering. So he explains. The only reason why you're saying thank you is because truthfully you're a debtor. You should have died. It's only God, due to his mercy, you survived. So why does it mean you deserve to die? Because you have sin. Chomets represents sin. That despite the sin, there's an element of sin, you survived. That's the representation of the 10 loaves which are made of leavened. 30, the vast majority of persons are good, but who's perfect? Nobody's perfect. So because of that, although it's a minority of imperfection, therefore you have to say thank you. You have to say thank you. Somebody comes to you and says, you know, you owe me a lot. I say, what do I owe you? Did you ever do, do me a favor? I've never even seen you before. I don't have to say thank you. There's no basis. But if you did do me a favor, whatever it may have been, there is, I, 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 I'm beholding to, at some level, whatever it is, every person is beholding to Hashem because nobody's perfect. There's no perfect tzaddik. Therefore, since there's always that element of sin and if it's, you're prosecuted because you're in a state of danger, so why did you survive? It's only due to God's mercy. Therefore, we say thank you, despite the imperfection or the flawed record which a person possesses. That's the significance and the symbolism of the 10 loaves which are leavened for that reason. Rabbi, why did it have to be 10? Why couldn't it be just one or two? We made the same point. You know, you say, Alan, it cost you $10. He says, well, why does it cost me a dollar? Why 10? That's, that's Alan's, Alan's question. Alan, I'm joking with you. 
The reason is, oh, ten, the number 10 always represents something which is a totality. 10 is always that number. Asar Mamers Nivra Olam. 10 is the totality. Therefore, I've been wasted 40. 40 is what? 40 is always, we find from conception to life is 40. Correct? We spent 40 years in the desert, right? And only then were we worthy to go into the land. 40 is always a period. Moshe spent 40 days and 40 nights studying the Torah. That, that is the full gamut. 10 is the tracks from the 40, but it's, it's a unit. 40 is, is made up of four tens, right? That is a unit of 10, 40. What was lacking? 10 of the 40 is flawed. That's, it's not one. It's a full entity of that 40 is, is, is what? Is flawed. So when, that, when you have that, everything, everything. See, it's interesting. In Pirkei Ovis, it says, God created the world with 10 utterances. Why? To punish the evil who undermined the world that was, that was created with 10 utterances and to give reward to the tzaddikim who uphold the world, which, is, which, is, which was created with 10, to increase their reward. So we, we mentioned Amen Maral, if you have 10 and you pull one out of the 10, what happens? You no longer have that unit of 10. Okay, I'm, I'm saying over here, 40 has a certain level of representation. When you pull the 10 out of it, which is a unit, it's four units of 10, it's no longer that, it doesn't function in that, in that, in that context. Therefore, 10 or that, I'm not sure if this is necessarily the answer, but that's, that's what maybe, maybe a possibility. But it's a good question, why 10? It's always a question, why the number? Is this the Lechem HaPanim? No, 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 no. Lechem HaPanim was 12. Is... The showbread with 12 loaves. That corresponded to Jewish. And the Lechem HaPanim were made of matzah. It was not chametz. The no. showbread was, was matzah, was not chametz. This is speak, specifically the thanks offering. A woman gives birth. That that she survived the birth. She brings a thanks offering. Besides her personal sacrifice she has to bring. So whatever person experiences... A miracle where he could have died, he didn't. You say thank you to God by bringing the forty loaves and the, and the animal as a as a thanks offering. So he says something interesting, the Chovetz Chaim. Why initially were the vipers sent? Why immediately did we have this lack of clarity and we came up with a a, a claim, right? The Jews. One, it said, look, it's another one of the problems. We we're about to go in, God had kept, kept us out again. And therefore, as a result of that, they said the mon is going to expand in our in intestines and we're going to die. What happens if you have a misreading? You know, sometimes a person has to be, comes with a claim and you say, we don't understand. There's no takeaways. If you have trust in God, there's no takeaway. And if you have a positive reading, it's fine. It's even better. Because the Jews stated something which was an accusation, whenever there's an accusation against God, there's a serious negative consequence. He says, today in our day and age, there are many questions we could ask. The Chafetz Chaim lived between World War I and World War II. The level, the result of World War I was devastating. It didn't compare to the Holocaust, but the communities were destroyed, upheavals, displaced. There was anti-Semitism. You could ask many questions. And if there, you, you, there's an accusing finger against God, brings that good stuff. Because whenever we find the Jews in the desert, he says, at, in our time, a person should remain silent. Because whenever you make this accusation, it activates a level of prosecution. You regret you ever said those words. Therefore, you have to have trust and faith. And if you toe that line and you have that trust, things will get better, not worse. And even if they get worse, we don't understand. We don't understand. 
They interpreted the manna because they were delayed. It doesn't make sense. But if you understand it correctly, it does make sense. Because God wants you to have the full benefit without any level of convenience. <coughs> Therefore, it's absorbed in your inner organs. Many years ago, when I was a yeshiva, a yeshiva student, and the yeshiva one I learned there in the early years, I'm going back to um, 1967. So the yeshiva where I learned, it was only learning, nothing else. There was no political discussion. Even though there was an Agudas Yisrael, which represents the more observant representation of the Jewish people. But still, you know, we're students. It's not for us, you know. There's time to reach there and get involved in communal responsibilities. Right now, you're a student, you have to focus on your studies. Okay, what happens? There was a certain person that had come from another yeshiva. He was about 20, 21 years old. And he was very politically oriented. And he's introducing, they should start, it's called Tzirei Gudis Yisroel. It's like the youth, it's the youth division of that Gudis Yisroel. And he's working in the crowd, the students, to start this new group representing the youth of this very orthodox position, representation of the Jewish people, which is good. That's good. But the question is, does it belong in the yeshiva? It's a distraction. We're, we're here to learn. We're not here to be distracted with other things, with issues outside of our learning. So this person goes, and he wants to make a Malav Malka. Saturday night, you know, we have Malav Malka to celebrate the Shabbos is over and to speak about this new project, Agudas Yisrael, Tzir Agudas Yisrael. So he was raising a dollar from each student to cover the expense of this Malav Malka. So he comes over to me and he says to me, uh, are you going to participate? I said, I won't give you a dime. It doesn't belong here. You shouldn't be doing it. Okay? So what does he do? He goes to Marish Yeshiva, Zech Tzarek and says, Kalatsky is ante agudas Yisroel. Yeah, this is what he tells Marish Yeshiva. Because I say to him, I will not, I will not give you a, a dime for it. I'm, you're, wrong, you're doing the wrong thing. So Rameshiva calls me over. He says, in Yiddish, I hear you're against Agudas Yisrael. I said, why? Why does the Rameshiva think this? Because he heard. So I said to him, this person has come. He's disrupted the learning of the, of the students in the Yeshiva. Till he arrived... Nobody was distracted with other things. All of a sudden, there's a new distraction. It may be a great cause, but it doesn't belong here. So here he's painting a black picture of me, and my Roshiva hears it. It's what's his name? He says, are you against that good Israel? I said, God forbid, I'm not against the good Israel. But you understand, it doesn't belong. It's not, and this is the, not the time and place for it. At, you do something right. Because it doesn't conform with his perspective, all of a sudden I'm a bad guy. After I explain my position, Marshiv says, "You know, you're right. It doesn't belong here. It doesn't belong." He, he was the person when he began this working the crowd. He didn't even consult to ask permission for this. Marshiv was unaware of it. It's only after the fact when he had people this and that. All of a sudden, he's coming with a claim. I'm interfering with his with his, with his project. The whole project doesn't belong there. God gives you something, but you know something doesn't make sense. But if you saw it from God's point of view, it makes a lot of sense. So the Chavetz Chaim says there are many things we don't we don't understand in our day and age. The world seems it's going off the cliff. What's God doing to us? You don't speak that way. You pray to be protected, to thrive, to succeed. That we do. But to go ask questions where well, you don't have the answers. And the answer usually is not the correct answer because it's not something positive. You know something? Let it bite your tongue. Don't say a word.
God says, make a copper snake and put it on a pole and let them look at the snake. And whoever looks at the snake, they will recover. So he asked the question, why wasn't Moshe's prayer, his supplication should have been enough? He prayed for things in the past. We did the golden calf, he prayed. Prayed. So why over here? Did he, why, why did he need that, that copper snake? And due to, only if you looked at it and you prayed and you did tshuva, only then did you recover. You know, the, the uh, Rambam rules, you know, Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. What is the mitzvah of Yom Kippur? What is the mitzvah? Lefnei Hashem Titoru. There's an obligation to do tshuva. During the year, there's no obligation to do tshuva, to repent. Rambam says, if you repent, I'll tell you how to repent. Yom Kippur, you have an obligation to repent. Why? Because it's the end of the line. Because he says, because it's so slich of kapora. God gives you a whole year to repent. Yom Kippur is the day. God is, is going to give the final, he's going to give the verdict. So if God's going to give the verdict, this, it's now or never. Therefore, you have an ob obligation to repent. Lefnei Hashem Titoru. Before God, you should repent. And we do tshuva. And we hope God gives. The verdict should be, as we say, l'chaim. You should be sealed in the book of life. Okay, good. Now the question is, the sin of the previous year, and it comes the next year of Kippur, does a person do tshuva for the previous year's sin if he already had done tshuva the previous year? Every year, should you do tshuva for any sin you ever done, you've ever done in your life? Not that you need the same level of remorse, but you should always feel the remorse and commit yourself never to do that again. So the Rama, based on the Gemara, says that even the sin of a previous year, and you already repented, you did tshuva, you should do tshuva again. Why? Because David HaMelech, King David says in Tilim, Chatosi lefnei, I ain't tomid. My sin is over before my eyes. God, he said, I'm always cognizant. I will never forget that sin. You know, there's an expression, out of sight, out of mind. Whatever is in the, in the forefront of your mind, you're always cognizant. Something that you're not cognizant, you don't keep that in mind, it takes the back burner. And it's as if it never was part of your life. So David says, any sin of the past, I live with that sin. And because I always agonize that I did that, therefore I never crossed that line again. That's David Melech. So therefore the Ramam says, even the sin of a previous year that you repented upon, you have to do tshuva again. You should go through the process again for that sin. And as a result of that, you will never go back there again. That's the Ramah based on the Gemara. Now, it's very important. You know, visual is, is very important to visualize something. As I always say, what is a wise man? It's not a person who understands the consequences or the ramifications of the future, you see it. Seeing is reality. We had just read about B'tzalel. Re'ei, Hashem says to Moshe, see I've chosen B'tzal benori benchur about you that should oversee the Mishkan. Seeing means it's unquestioned. He has qual his qualifications. Nobody has those qualifications. Therefore, there's nobody but him. Th that's seeing. You have to see that snake. You have to see that bronze, that copper snake. Why? Because the old, because unless you have that in your mind, it doesn't go away so simple. You have to see it continuously and understand the consequences of what a snake means. That's the power of the prosecutor. The prosecutor, that is the prosecutor of Jewish people. He's the snake. And because of what you spoke, which you shouldn't have said, you activated that snake. And when you think about it, you see it. And therefore it's in a high pole, Never to forget what the consequences of your speech. You activated that. You know, um, you have a bomb. You have to have a certain 
activator to ignite to activate that bomb. Without it, the bomb doesn't go off. But if you have the activator, you know, the terrorists, your machshmam zichram, they used to get these cell phones at uh, buy them at, you know, at the pharmacy. And they use these cell phones to, to set off these car bombs, right? When they, they dialed a number, that was it. It went off. Our mouths set off, unfortunately, much, much tragedy. When you speak out of turn, you activate that snake. You have to see it before your eyes. And that's why the tefillah wasn't enough. Moshe praying is not enough. I could pray for you. You know, people go for, to Rabbi Pinto comes. They ask him for a blessing. Or you go to another person, ask for blessings. But you're not going to change your behavior. You know, so if you change your behavior, you have to be more worthy, okay? Because you did something wrong. So a bracha could br take you over the hump. But if you're not changing your behavior, why, 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 should, you, why, why, should, you, why should you be blessed? You don't deserve to be blessed. See, so she give you a blessing. It's the same thing. At this point, Moshe Rabbeinu's tefillah wouldn't, wouldn't be enough. Because of what you did, you have to be cognizant continuously. Therefore, you have to have it before your eyes never forget about it. You know, very often, you know, people say things to another person, say, you don't let me forget. You don't let, let me live it down. You now, some people, you know, they have to be reminded. And they take it personal. You know, you don't let me forget. You shouldn't forget. You know, Lahavdil El Fabdolus, Mayor Kahana, he his slogan of the Jewish Defense League, never again. Never again. That was his slogan. Right? We have somebody who people who knew Mayor Kahana. Never again. So Rav Shach then said. Not regarding this, but he said something. Could a Jew say never again, God forbid? Are we in a position to say never again? But God makes the decisions. There was a Holocaust. Why was the Holocaust? Because God allowed the Holocaust to be. If God forbid, there are other tragedies. The terrorist attacks. There are many things. Of course, we have to do what we have to do to correct and to defend ourselves. No question. But to say... We will not, never again, this should never be. God, if God wants for whatever reason and it's necessary, God forbid. You can't, we can't make decisions. You know, we can't play God to say what is and what's not going to be. And I always tell over the story, the Chavetz Chaim, you know, in Europe, the Jews were, were actually confined to ghettos and they had very little land to build on and they had the houses were built one on top of the other. And the structures were made of wood. So that if there was ever a fire, everybody would just take, they, if a person was a Torah scholar, he would take his, his manuscripts and run for his life. And his wife would run with the kids. Of course, the town within moments would burn down. It was all, especially if it was dry, dry season. Okay? So there was a, a, a village not far from Rodden. There was a fire. The town was totally decimated. And people were living in the, under the elements. Winter was coming, and they had to create some kind of shelter for, the, for these poor people, to feed them, to clothe them, and provide shelter. This guy, Chaim, goes to this very wealthy man who lived in a stone mansion, and he says to the person, you know, your brother, your brethren, they're suffering. They don't have what to eat. They don't have clothing. Everything was destroyed. I'm asking you to give something substantial to help them out. He says, I'm not interested. He says, how could you not be interested? You were a Jew. They're your brothers. He says, look, I earn my, what I have. My wealth is mine. I don't have to give it to anyone. It's mine to keep. They never did anything for me. Nobody ever did anything for me. So he says, but don't you realize, even though God first of all gave you the blessing to have, if part of that blessing means you're supposed to give minimally 10%, 20%, to give to charity. He says, I have to give nothing. It's mine. And I'm so secure. Nobody could ever take it from me. Okay? Chavetz Chaim says, but you realize, as a Jew, you're not permitted to speak this way. And if you do speak the way, you have to learn the hard way. I mean, he could have said to him, you know, it may be all the U.S. God pulls the plug. You're not here. So everything means nothing. He says, he says, you know something, but God, you realize God could take it from you in a moment. In a moment. This is impossible. I'm so diversified. 
invested in so many different things. If one thing fails, I'm covered. I'm hedged to the hilt. Nothing to worry about. Chavetz Chaim says, a Jew doesn't speak the way you speak. And yet, unfortunately, you're going to have to taste the bitter pill. What happens? The Russians, during the Tsarist times, were rabid anti-Semites. All Russians. And whenever the Russian army would go through a Jewish community, the Jews would actually go behind shuttered doors because they never knew, you know, in a, any little whatever may be, they may just destroy the town. So there was a general, he was known, known pompous type of person. And he comes and with his troops and he marches through this Jewish town. And he dismounts and he's leading his horse, leading his troops and all the people looking through the windows and he passes over a bridge. Going into this town and he had spurs in his boots. And one of the knots in the, of the wood of the bridge, the knot was punched out and his spur gets stuck there. He twists his ankle and breaks his ankle. This Russian general, the man is infuriated, livid. Who owns this bridge? Who owns, who was responsible to maintain this bridge? Who do you think it was? This Jew. Immediately, he had him sent to Siberia. That was the end of the story. In a moment, it's over. God pulls the plug, it's over. He doesn't have to take your life. In a moment, all your assets are gone. But there was a Jew, just uh, something which is uh, current, not long ago. Putin is the is the what, what, prime minister of Russia. And there was a certain Jew who had criticized him. And he was, this Jew was one of the uh, Golarks. He was worth billions, he was worth $19 billion. You know what happened? Because he criticized Putin, in one moment he transferred all his money to someone else, put him in prison. And even when his prison term was up, extended his prison term. Because he understood. You don't, you don't critic, criticize Putin. But he got $19 billion. But you realize Putin could take that $19 billion and put it in somebody else's pocket. That's what he did. That's what he did. We have questions. We have pain. You can't speak out of turn. And that's what the Chavetz Chaim says. Whenever you speak out of turn, there's always very se severe consequences. Therefore, he says, today, although we see things and we experience things, a person who feels and believes in God should never ever say anything negative or critical. And only then will merit the bracha at the end. Okay, we'll stop here today. We continue tomorrow at 12 o'clock. We have Dafyomi today at from 11 to 12. 11 to 12. Okay. okay. Be well. Good uh, to see Alan. Good, good to see everyone. Thank you. Take care, Larry, Rabbi. be well. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. A good, I have a, good, a conference call now, Rabbi. A good so I'll be there as close to 11 as I can. Okay, it's Rosh Chodesh today, everybody. I know. That's, yeah, uh, okay. You, you reminded me last night. I good. did send out to uh, Okay, so you said, you, you said Halil. You said Halil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, okay. I got it. I good. did. Terrific. <laughs> be well.